Good morning. Before they sneak off, I'd like you to say thanks to Griffin and Drew for leading us in music as we entered the space today. Say thank you to them. For Griffin, it was his confirmation project that he had put together, and for Drew, he's just got the talent, so he was able to extend that to us this morning. Hey, great to have all of you here. My name is Kai Nielsen, one of the pastors of this congregation. On behalf of Incarnation, we're delighted that you could be here. Uh, special welcome to family who's here for the celebration of confirmation. What we hope you experience in this is uh, different adding on, going to different places. Um, but what we hope you're experiencing is that the core mission that we have is to fill the world with God's grace and love. And in the singing today, in the just the blessing of our kids, and in the envisioning of the kind of life that they have ahead of them, which is a very exciting life for all of us, um, we hope that you experience some of God's grace. Uh, if those who are joining us on, online, we're delighted for you too. And my mic goes like this. And we'll just switch over to this for a moment. So um, the, the service itself uh, is going to be a picture of what we hope uh, these uh, students today are affirming their faith into. So there will be a blessing that they're going to receive from the church officially, from us as we bless them as they make their way to the baptismal font. There's going to be a blessing from family. The family will gather around them, and the congregation will also join in the blessing. This is what it takes these days for us to continue to raise uh, our kids in the faith and for them to be able to claim what God has been doing in their lives already. And so it's going to be a celebration of all of those aspects for us. We're going to begin today with just a simple confession. As we, uh, you'll see it on the screen, I invite you to stand. Through the creative power of our Creator God, we are alive with resurrection power. By the sacrificial love of Jesus' death and resurrection, we are alive with resurrection power. With the renewing presence of the Spirit of God, we are alive with resurrection power. God of resurrection power, forgive us when we neglect the goodness of your creation, live only for ourselves, and believe we can live by our own power and be indifferent to the needs of others. In the quiet of this time, we pause for a moment of silent confession and reflection. Friends, the Apostle Paul reminds us that God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, has made us alive together with Christ. Your sins are gone. Your lives are being renewed in resurrection love. Thanks be to God. We sing together. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just, a, just a quick word before we start. I uh, just want to welcome everybody, and uh, uh, for those of you who come to the 1015 service, some of these songs may be familiar, some may be not familiar at all, um, but we certainly want to welcome you to sing along with us, and uh, as you hear the choruses come around, feel free to join in. We'd love to have you sing with us, so here we go. Ready? One, two, three, four. my way, and I forget my name, remind me who I am, in the mirror all I see, I'm who I don't want to be, remind me who I am, in the loneliest
receive your love. Afraid I'll never be enough. Remind me who I am. If I'm your
Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning uh, to worship your holy name, to think of all the ways in which you have shown up for us in the past, to remember in those days when the sun is shining, when all, all things seem right within the world, and we come and worship you. And on those days when the darkness settles in, days when it's so dreary and it's hard to drag ourselves out of bed, we worship you on those days too. And we look forward to that day when we'll be able to join our voices with all the angels in heaven and in earth and under the earth and proclaim that you are the risen Christ, the one who has come to save us, the one who has come to give us new life through that resurrection power which we call upon this day. So bless us now, bless the reading of your word, open our hearts and minds to see all that you have for us this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You may be seated. My name's Joel Vanderwall, one of the pastors here, and this weekend is kind of a special weekend, uh, not just in the life of this congregation, because we get to hear all of our confirmands affirm their faith and affirm their baptismal promises, uh, but also more personally for me, my family's in out of town. Uh, maybe you know what that's like to have family in from out of town. They came from Illinois and Michigan to celebrate uh, a special milestone birthday. I turned 40, uh, and so we've been having a chance to celebrate together. And in the midst of that, uh, I started remembering some childhood memories. I don't know if you've ever done that before. Things of joy, like going on vacation together, but more often it was times when, when my parents were out of the house, and it was just us kids. And the things we got to do together. I remember one time we were chasing around some little bunnies in our backyard and shooing them towards the window wells, and they fell into the basement. And we caught like four or five of these bunnies. And we kept them for like two or three days. And then we discovered they weren't eating anything and that they were terrified. And so we released them to the wild again. Hopefully they survived. Uh, but it reminded me of another time, too, of when my parents were gone. And my younger brother, Ben, and I were finishing up our Pinewood Derby cars. And we were in the basement. We took out uh, an old grocery bag, a paper bag, put it on the ground, and we were painting them. We were using spray paint to sp paint them. And, and all of a sudden, I don't know if it was me or if it was you, Ben, but one of us, like, accidentally sprayed the other one. And we're like, we're like what are you doing? And... And before you know it, we are covered head to toe in blue and white paint. It was, it was horrifying. The, you know, the things that you can get away with when your parents aren't around, when that authority figure is away. Pastor Kai was on a pastor's retreat all week this week. And just imagine what the staff did. Like, it's, it's just, we had a lot of fun together. Now, my brother Ben said I could tell that story only if I also said that he was the one who won the spray paint fight. And I think he only wanted me to say that because he knew that his older brother, my older brother, were here, and then his niece and nephew were here, and he wanted to look puffed up. But honestly, who wins in a spray paint fight? <laughs> you don't ever win, Ben. Like, everyone just loses, okay? It's interesting because there's, there's a sense that, that maybe when that authority figure is away, that things can devolve very quickly, Right? that it can snowball so quickly. And sometimes this, this same pattern gets lived out in history. There is, there is this belief within human nature, I think, that whenever there's this movement and there's a strong animosity against that movement, that if you were able to take out the leader, that that movement would fall apart. So think, for example, some of the historical examples we have of like William Wallace leading the Scottish and Edward the Longshanks believes if they just kill William Wallace, everything will go away. Or you think even in modern history of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. or Malcolm X, the belief that if you just kill the leader, the movement will go away. Well, the same was true of the Jesus movement. There was this belief that if you were to kill Jesus, that movement would have gone away. There's a story in John chapter 11, just after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, where all of the Pharisees begin to get worried and anxious, and, 
and they don't know what to do. They're afraid that the Romans will come in and will wipe them out. And so they gather together with the chief priests, and all of a sudden the high priest, Caiaphas, stands up, and he, he has like this arrogant tone with him, so you got to imagine that. And he says, you know nothing at all. Like, just hear that arrogance within it. You know nothing at all. Don't you know that it's better for one man to die than for the whole nation to be destroyed? And with that, the movement started. The chief priests, the Pharisees, began to plot on how they would kill Jesus. And so the question is, what happens when that leader dies? Maybe another way to phrase it is, what happens to the sheep when the shepherd goes away? There's another story in John chapter 21, and and that's the story we're going to look at today. So if you have your Bibles, you can open to John 21 or maybe look it up on your phone. It's a story of when when Jesus appears to his disciples. Here are these words from the book that we love. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to his disciples and he, by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself to them in this way. Gathered together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of Jesus' disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. So they went out and got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach and he said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? And they said to him, no. And Jesus said to them, cast your nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul in the net because it was so full of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard this, he put on clothes for he was naked, and he jumped into the sea. The other disciples came to land aboard the ship, dragging the net with them, for they were not far off from land, only about a hundred yards. As they came ashore, they saw charcoal fire there, with fish and bread on it. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard the boat and he dragged the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though the net was so full, it was not torn. And then Jesus said, come and have some breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread And he gave it to the disciples. He did the same with the fish also. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he had been raised from the dead. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. This story captivates me. I don't know if you could tell that. I am just absolutely captivated by this story. Early on, we know that Jesus is appearing to his disciples. It it actually begins this way, after these things. Which means we need to go back and look at, well, after what things. In John chapter 20, Jesus appears to his disciples in the locked room. Do you remember this story? There were only ten that were gathered there that night. One of them had already died, Judas, and another was missing. Do you remember who that other one was that was missing? Thomas, yeah. And Jesus comes to them. And he breathes on them the Holy Spirit and says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And so the disciples have this charge to go out and talk to other people about what they have just witnessed. And the first person they go to is Thomas. Thomas wasn't there. It should be pretty easy to convince Thomas that that Jesus raised from the dead. I mean, after all, Thomas had been journeying with them for the last three years. Thomas had seen all those miracles that Jesus had performed. Thomas had heard all of those things that Jesus had said. Even even in John chapter 11, when Jesus was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, Thomas said, we will go with you and we will die with you. Thomas is ready to give his life for Jesus. And what happened? Did Thomas believe? No. No. You can, you can talk back to me. It's okay. Did Thomas believe? No. He didn't, right? He doubted. He said, unless I put my finger in his hand and my hand in his side, I will not believe. 
And so Jesus appears again to his disciples, again in the locked room a week later. And Jesus says to Thomas, Thomas, come here. Put your finger in my hand. Put your, side, your hand in my side. Don't doubt, but believe. And Thomas confesses, my Lord and my God. So think about that just for a moment. The first person the disciples tell, one of their closest friends, one who has been journeying with them these last three years, doesn't believe. Disciples actually obey what Jesus tells them to do, and the first time they try it out, they fail. It tells us that Jesus is at the Sea of Tiberias because that's where the disciples are. The disciples shouldn't be at the Sea of Tiberias. They should be out in Jerusalem telling others about what has happened. Peter says to those disciples, I am going fishing, and there may be a couple of ways to think about that. It's, it's hard in the state of Minnesota to think about fishing other than recreation, but that's not what he meant by it. He wasn't going fishing just so that he could go eat, like, I'm going to go make a grilled cheese sandwich. That's not what he meant by it. He's not going fishing like he, he is just catching up on a hobby that he let loose, like he's going to go play around a golf. Like that's, that's not what he means by this. The, the word in Greek that's used there is hupago, and it means I am going fishing and I am never coming back. I'm never coming back to what Jesus has told us to do. Why would Peter say that? Because remember, Peter is the one who walked on water. Peter's the one who was up on that mountaintop with James and John, and he saw Jesus transfigured. He saw Moses and Elijah. He heard God's voice from heaven say, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. This is the same Peter that, that when Jesus wanted to wash his feet, he pushed Jesus away. You will never wash my feet. Peter is a passionate man. He is ready to do what Jesus asks. This is the same Peter who, when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane, pulled out his sword to defend Jesus and cut off the ear of one of the Roman soldiers. Why would he say, I'm going fishing and never coming back? Maybe it's because it's the same Peter who, who couldn't stay awake in that Garden of Gethsemane. When that's the only thing Jesus was begging and pleading him to do. Maybe it's, it's because... When Jesus was taken away and Peter followed behind at a distance and stayed in the courtyard while Jesus was on trial, Peter denies ever knowing Jesus three times. Maybe it's because Peter was in that crowd that day when Pilate came out with Jesus and said, what will you have me do with him? And the crowd shouted, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And Peter, Peter couldn't say a word. Maybe it's because this is the same Peter who saw Jesus dragging his cross through the city of Jerusalem on his way to Golgotha, falling time and time again, and Peter couldn't help out. Or maybe it's because he saw Jesus take his last breath and couldn't do anything to save him. And then when he finally listens and does what Jesus asks him to do in John chapter 20, Thomas doesn't believe. Do you remember what happened next? They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just imagine that for a moment of being in Peter's place. You have failed over and over again. These last two weeks have been horrible. And now you finally think you're going to try to do something new. And you wake up and you have nothing to show for it. Have you ever experienced failure like that before? Have you sensed that same feeling of shame and desperation? It was about eight years ago around this time when I told our previous congregation that, that we were leaving and moving to Minnesota. Uh, we were going to uproot our family and move further away from our own family so that I could try to live into this dream of becoming a college professor or a seminary professor. To do that, I needed to get another master's degree. And so Amanda and I, we took out tens of thousands of student loans 
and began to settle here in Minnesota. I started on another master's degree, and at the end of that degree, I was applying to PhD programs and got rejection letter after rejection letter after rejection letter. Fail, 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 fail. I don't know if you know this, but loan officers don't care if you don't get into a PhD program. It doesn't seem to matter to them. And so that anxiety began to rise within me. What are we going to do? We've uprooted our family and moved to a completely new community. We've transplanted, and, and our resources aren't what they once were. And so I started applying to different churches around the area. And, and again, rejection after rejection after rejection. Joel, you don't have the right skills that we need. Joel, we're looking for somebody with more experience. Joel, we just don't think you're the right fit. What do you do in those moments of failure? Honestly, I don't know how I would have made it if it wasn't for my wife, Amanda, and my parents telling me over and over again, Joel, we love you. Joel, we love you. And it wasn't because of anything I could do. It was simply because I was married to a beautiful woman and I was the son of loving parents. I was their child. In verse 5, it says, Just after daybreak, just when that darkness is settling in, the light pierces into that darkness. And Jesus stood on the beach and he called out to the disciples, children. Did you catch that? Now the writer of John could have used a different Greek word there. He could have used the word technon, but instead he uses the word paideia, which, which is a lot like how Jesus calls, calls his own heavenly father, Abba, Daddy, it's meant to signify intimacy. Dear children, it's, it's like saying, my treasured possessions. My treasured possessions. I know that you have failed, but you are my beloved. You are my children. You are the one in whom I am well pleased with. And as soon as as they hear the word children, you notice what the disciple whom Jesus loves does? Peter, Peter, it is the Lord. He does exactly what he's supposed to do. He points to Christ and has everyone else looking at him. Peter then puts on clothes and jumps in the water. How many of you put on clothes before you jump in the water? It makes no sense, does it? He puts on clothes because it signifies that, his, that he receives this new identity in Christ. He recognizes that he's, he's not just a failure, that the shame cycle that he finds himself in is, isn't meant to stay, but he puts on new clothes and, as Paul would say later, and clothes himself with Christ, enters into the water and is made new once again. It's, it's like the waters of baptism that we celebrate today at Confirmation, that all of our confirmands, as they affirm that baptismal promise, they too are reminded that they are children of God, that they are God's most loved possessions. That's the beauty of this story. And what's more, did you notice, whoops, did you notice that after that, Jesus meets them on the beach and feeds them? He feeds them so that they can be nourished, so that they can be encouraged in order to go forth and do what Jesus called them to do. To go and tell others about him. To go and tell others about that story of how they have been made new and that this is meant to reach out to all the world. It's interesting because there's, at that time, there are known of 153 species of fish. And that detail in there is meant to convey that though the net was not torn, that this message was meant for all people. That all people can be gathered together to hear this good news, to be reminded that they are God's beloved children. And so, 
in a few moments, we're going to get to experience that together. We're going to get a chance to bless our confirmands. We're going to get a chance as a community of faith to pray over them, to remind them of who they are and whose they are in Christ, to be sent forth from this place with the power of the Holy Spirit, to share that love of God with all people. In a few moments, Sean and the band are going to play a song called, um, I forget the name of it. What is it? Come as you are. And as we do that, we're going to invite our confirmands to come forward. So confirmands, if you're sitting in this section or this section, you'll start us off. You're going to receive a blessing from the baptismal fount during the song. You'll receive a stole and you'll receive a prayer square and a prayer card. We want you to take that and bring that back to your seat, okay? It's good to have someone ready to go right away, all right? If you're sitting in this section, wait until these sections are done. If you want to even come all the way out and go around, you can do that too, okay? Why don't we have you do that? So as we begin, just go out and walk this way forward, all right? Uh, after that, we're going to move in through part of the liturgy of the service that invites the confirmands to affirm those baptismal vows, and then we'll take communion together. Sean, I think we're ready. Oh, sinner, come to me. 
God, who is rich in mercy and love, gives us a new birth into a living hope through the sacrament of baptism. When we were joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we were clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. We give thanks to God for the gift of baptism and for these persons, one with us in the body of Christ, who affirm their baptism this day as a sign of their participation in the life of this community of faith and its mission in the world. We present the following individuals who desire to affirm their baptism. Confirmands, you'll stand when your name is called. Sophia Marie Anderson. Griffin William Bolt. Andrew Lawrence Callahan. Audrey Jane Carlson. Todd Alexander Carroll. Britta Jean DePhillips. Brody John Doolam. Cole Albert Eben, Anya Letnis Erickson, Ian Craig Fallgatter, Cooper Richard Fellman, Johanna Christina Fitzel, Luca Grace Galvin, Addison K. Hemquist, Haley Lisbeth Johansson, Alexander Christopher Shipman Johnson, Tegan Jean Lebke, Benjamin James Manneke, Annika Grace McCarthy, Anya Leave Norman. Kennedy Rebecca Osland, Nels William Peterson, Charlie Nelson Robb, Andrew Lee Roloff, Emily Violet Stockland. Cole Gregory Straka, Chloe Elizabeth Swenson, Madison Christine Thyron, Christine Levin Venzile, Sydney Audra Went. Now, one of the things we also want to let you know is that one of our confirmands uh, tested positive for COVID and isn't able to be with us, but I'm told that he's online. Wave, hi, thank you for being here today. It's good that you're here. With your, with your family and with your community here in Christ. Mm -hmm. Let's pray together. Oh God, thank you for the gift of these precious ones. Stir up your Holy Spirit within them. Help them to open themselves to you. Fill them with your gifts of love, joy, and peace, and guide them in life toward union with you. We ask these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, Confirmands, this is the time in the service where I'm going to ask you some questions. I will give you the response in the question and invite you to say that loud and proud, right? Loud and proud, okay? As you affirm your baptism, I ask you to reject sin, profess faith in Christ, and confess the faith of the church. Do you turn away from the ways of sin that draw you from God? If so, please say, I do. That was pretty good. Okay. All right. Do you turn to Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, please say, in faith I turn to Christ. That was a little shaky. The next one's a little bit longer, okay? So you're doing great so far. You have made public profession of your faith. Do you intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in holy baptism, to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, to serve all people following the example of Jesus, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth? If so, please say, I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. Come on. I do. Well done, Confermans. <laughs> well done. Oh, it's going to get better. All right, people. This is our turn. People of God, do you promise to support these precious ones and pray for them in their life in Christ? If so, please say, we do, and we ask God to help and guide us. We do, and we, and we ask, ask God, God to help and guide us. us. 
Do you see how good awesome. you were at leading already, <laughs> Confermans? Like already the congregation knew what to do because you were leading them. Thank you for doing that. Wonderful. Families, now's the time for you to gather around your confirmand to lay hands on them and invite one person from each of your groups to say the prayer of blessing that you can find on the back of your prayer card. Confirmands, I invite you to each hold onto your prayer squares like we talked about during this blessing and let it be a reminder to you of this day and the support around you. I'll read it first and then we'll give you all a chance to share in that blessing as families. And it goes like this. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in these confirmands the gift of your Holy Spirit, confirm their faith, guide their life, empower them in serving, give them patience in suffering, and bring them to everlasting life. Amen. Families, bless away. Our service continues with the gift of Holy Communion. In the celebration of passage the other night, we reminded confirmands that Holy Communion is our opportunity to celebrate this holy gift from Jesus. And in it, we receive two things. We receive forgiveness of sin. We also receive that promise of the forgiveness, but also our unconditional love that we have from our Father in heaven. And so I invite all to participate in our service of Holy Communion. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine and gave thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Just a reminder to all that this table is open for all. Christ is the host and welcomes all of us to this table. Regardless of your denomination or background, you are w welcome to this table. As you come forward to receive the body and blood of our Lord Savior Jesus Christ, you can receive a wafer. We also have gluten-free wafers. And then we celebrate Holy Communion by intinction, where you would dip it either into the wine, which is the darker colored liquid, or the white grape juice, which is the lighter colored liquid. If you are someone who would prefer to just receive our communion cups that are already prepared, you can pick those up also when you come forward, and we will still give you the words, the body and blood of our Lord given for you. All is ready. Uh, an offer, offering are also, offerings are also um, in the stools as you come forward. All is ready. Come and eat.
I sing for my Redeemer, the maker of the stars and sea. You looked upon my suffering and came for me. Rejected and despised you hung. Alone upon that sinner's hill My Savior's hands bled for my peace And hold me still Jesus, be my Savior. Jesus, be my all. Jesus, be my Savior. Be my all in all. We take this sweet communion, remembering the price you the cup of suffering exchanged for grace. It wasn't nails that kept him there that held our Maker's hands in place. It was the love that overcame our sin and shame. Jesus, be my Savior. Jesus, be my own. Jesus, be my Savior, be my all in all. Jesus, be my Savior. Jesus, be my all. Jesus, be my Savior.
we take this sweet communion, remembering the price you exchanged for grace. It wasn't nails that kept him there, that held our Maker's hands in the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. 
a couple of announcements before you go. We just want to thank you for coming to this special confirmation service and invite you to take advantage of the faith projects and view those out in the atrium. We also have the prayer cards that are available in the baskets in the back. If you would like to take one of those with you today to remind yourself of all of the individuals who were, were confirmed today and you could pray for them the same prayer that we used, feel free to grab one of those on your way out today. Also, we have a special offering of letters as a part of our work as we feed the hungry in heart, body, mind, and spirit. And so we can communicate to federal officials. Our hunger advocacy group is out in our lobby and has materials for you. If you would like to be part of a letter writing campaign to our national leaders to encourage them to increase funding for global nutrition and expand our hunger support for children in the United States. And so we could all make a difference if we put our pen to paper and advocate for those who have no voice. Also, as part of our hunger advocacy work, we have three beautiful giant mosaics out in the atrium that are also on loan this month from the St. Paul Area Synod, again, as part of our efforts to raise awareness to feed the hungry in heart, body, mind, and spirit. Tomorrow night, we have our last adult education hour we call Kairos, and it will be led by Pastor Luther Dale in the second of a two-part series on creation care. That will be right here in the building on the Fireside Room at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Also, just for those people affiliated with this community, make sure you're aware that we are going to be sending a survey, a very brief one out um, in the coming weeks so that you're ready to do it and get it back to us because it will help us receive information from you about our worship services and also how we approach our ministries with children, youth, and family. So watch for that churchwide survey. Lastly, next weekend, just a reminder to everybody, it is going to be Mother's Day next weekend, so heads up. And, <laughs> and so Mother's Day, we always celebrate with quilts. Quilts often are draped over all of our pews. Many of them are, will be for sale, so if you're interested in um, celebrating the quilting ministry of our congregation, you could purchase a quilt. All those funds go toward buying more quilting materials. So at this time, I invite you to stand for our closing hymn. Sing with us. I believe in the sun.
reminder for all of our confirmands to meet in Grace Hall for a quick group photo. First thing, head right over to Grace Hall for the photo. And receive this blessing. God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love for which he loved us, has made us alive together in Christ. Go now to be God's grace and love in the world. Thanks be to God. Have a blessed week, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Oh.